In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. The reason. In the middle of the storm, louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar. Up from the ashes, hope will arise. Death is defeated, the king is alive. Woo! Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Glad to know Bruce is here. Good morning to everybody else, and good morning to all of you who are watching online. Thank you for participating with us and continuing to worship with us. Uh, we hope that you will uh, comment below. Let us know where you're watching from, maybe what's going on. Just let us know you're there. Also, I want to let you guys who are online know that there's a digital connect card at the in the description of this broadcast. And so 
you can click on that dude and uh, let us know if there's ways we can partner with you, if we can pray for you, uh, if you are, uh, have questions, if there's any way we can serve you, please click on that. Uh, also, uh, at this point, we want to welcome all of you who are here. Those of you who are here in person got you one of these fancy bulletins right here, okay? And uh, so in here is some information about the life of our church. God bless you. And, uh, and also in the bottom third of this, uh, for you is a, a connect card for those of you who are here. So if there's ways we can pray for, pray with you, uh, you can fill this out and drop it in the offering baskets on the way out uh, this, uh, after the, in the end of the service. So at the uh, doors on the way out, we're going to have offering baskets a little bit later on, and you can give your offering there. If you call the well or First Methodist Church your home, uh, you can make your gift there on the way out, and uh, you can also drop this in. I tell you that specifically because um, we, uh, a, couple, a few weeks ago, uh, before we knew we were coming back over here, we gave uh, you an opportunity to re-sign up or re-up to serve in different areas. We had no idea we were going to get to come back here, and so one of the things we did not include on that sign-up sheet was uh, set up and tear down here at the well. Uh, we had some technical things on there, but, but like we still are looking for people to drive trailers, to unload and load the trailer in and out, set up classrooms. Um, every Sunday morning before this happens, we, we got a lot of things that we, pieces that we put together. Uh, we also are looking for people with a pickup truck who can, or SUV I should say too, uh, can put out signage to help people get here. So if you're interested in that, you can fill out your Connect card and where it says uh, on the bottom there, there's opportunities to check different things. If you just say, I'm interested in serving at the well, we will follow up with you and find a place where God is calling you to serve, right? So if you, particularly today, if you have a pickup truck, if you have a strong back and a weak mind like some of us, just kidding, uh, if you're willing, uh, please uh, check that off. We would love to help you uh, help us. And so that's there. I got a couple other housekeeping or uh, events, I should say. Two things that I want to make sure you are aware of. Number one, Vacation Bible School. Have we said anything about that before yet? Yeah, it's very exciting. There are still sign-up sheets for volunteers and students in the lobby area, the narthex, whatever. We, not, not, that's not large, that's lobby, this part, where the food is. You know where that's at, right? Yeah, you know where that's at. You can grab a sign-up sheet there, and it's going to be a great week. We'd love for you to find a place to serve and also find a place to bring your children. And so uh, that is going to be a blast. That's coming up very soon. And then uh, another event is um, we are having a 4th of July celebration, okay? So this is super exciting. We just felt like it was time for us to be back together and have some kind of cookout, hangout, snow cones, water slide, the whole nine yards, pulled pork sandwich, you name it. We're going to have that, okay? Now we're calling it 4th of July, but I need to make sure you're fully aware it is not on the 4th of July, okay? It is the week before. It's June the 27th, 5.30 at our main campus, okay, 208 Pine Street, right there uh, behind the Sonic, if you will. Uh, we would love for you to come and join us. It's for all ages. There's going to be a ton of stuff to do, be a good meal and a good time. So June the 27th, we are celebrating a week in advance, the independence of our nation, 5.30. You follow me? Give me a thumbs up. I can't see you anyway, but there we go. Okay, I just want to make sure you're with me. All right. And then finally, this thing here, this is going to be fun, okay? This is going to be fun, and it is a great cause, okay? So usually summertime at the well is a little bit different. Sometimes it's a little crazy, but we like to celebrate summer, and, and, and we've, we've done a lot of things in the past. This year, we're inviting you to play a little bingo, and I know that's what everybody's wish is for the summer is to play bingo, right? Come on, talk to me. I'm just kidding. You're like, what is he talking about? So just as a way to engage with you and to engage with each other, I know some of you have been waiting for a year and a half to get out and travel, and so you might not be here every week. We have an opportunity for you to stay connected uh, through this bingo card. I'm going to explain how it works. There are different uh, charges, if you will, or different challenges for each block, okay? I'm just going to read randomly. Like, this is, a, this is an easy one. It's beneficial for you, too. Read Daniel chapter 1 through 6. Like, you could cross that off your bingo card, right? Or down here somewhere you could say, uh, I don't know, there's one on here for volunteering for Vacation Bible School, right? Oh, yeah, right there. You could volunteer for Vacation Bible School. B block that off your list. For every row that you get, so whether across or down, for every row, we are going to donate $5 to a charity, which I'm going to explain 
here in a moment. If you fill up the whole thing, which I would highly encourage you to do, that's 20 bucks towards the Scots in Honduras. Now, I'm going to tell you about the Scots. Scots are a family. They happen to be friends of mine. Brian Scott uh, and I went to seminary together. He is originally from Loosedale area of Mississippi, George County. Uh, grew up in the similar areas. His, grand, his uncle was my pastor for a season. And uh, Brian and Charity, his wife is named Charity, they have uh, tons of kids. Uh, they are adopting a couple of kids in Honduras. They are doing incredible ministry in mission work in Honduras. And so your participation in this, which keeps us all engaged, is also going to support a very good cause. And you can read a ton more about their ministry here on the back. This is also going to be our ministry and mission focus for Vacation Bible School. And so uh, we want you to learn about the Scots. You will hear from them probably on a video later in the summer. And uh, I would just encourage you to read more about them and to participate in this. There are some other things that uh, will help you stay engaged as you check off these boxes. So is everybody ready to play bingo? When you get done with this, you're going to write your name in this little part right here and bring it back and put it in the offering baskets at some point throughout the summer, right? And as we collect these, we are going to send money to the Scots. Is that fair enough? So this, you should do this, right? They're depending on you. <laughs> but we want you to put your name on here because we would like to thank you uh, for doing that. So is, there, is that clear for everyone? Grab one of these on the way out and uh, make sure you fill it out. Have I missed anything or everything, right? Am I good? Anything? Okay. I'm going to pray for us. And uh, I'm going to also pray for our offering. Uh, I mentioned that earlier. Um, this will be something we do toward the end of the service. But uh, know that uh, the gifts that you bring uh, is really a sign of your trust in God to provide for all of your needs. But it's also a way for you to invest in the mission and the ministry of this church as we seek to tell everyone about this man named Jesus who has changed our lives. So let us pray and move forward in worship. God, we're grateful for your son Jesus for uh, his work in our world and in our own lives. We're thankful for the redemption that we have experienced personally and, God, for the hope that we have for the whole world. And so we ask that you would uh, receive our praise this morning. As we come together and sing songs, may, may they bring a pleasing sound to your ears, not because we sing well, but because our hearts are aligned with yours. And so center us, Lord Jesus, on your will and your purpose for our lives. May we bring honor and glory to your name this day as we sing, as we pray, as we proclaim the good news of your word. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Then sing with us this morning. I want to be close to you. I want to be close to you. There's nothing in this world that compares to all you are. In the arms of the Father, there is love like no other. He who formed all things, he Offers love to me, and where you go, we will follow through the dark, through the narrow, and in all we do, we are bound to.
We'd love to invite all of our children to head out to the Well Junior, and you guys can head to the back. And families, we're actually celebrating communion today, so the kids will come back to us at the end of the service and celebrate communion with us. All right. So good morning again. Those of you who s slipped in as I, after I sat back down, it's good to see you all. I can see you a little better now with the lights. And so uh, again, I want to say welcome. We're so glad that you are here. Uh, last week was our first week back here at USM, and we kicked off a new sermon series on uh, the, the person Daniel. And we actually didn't even talk about Daniel last week, right? And so, uh, but we, we had to kind of paint the picture. And what we discovered last week is that, and, and we're going to discover even more today, that Daniel, uh, along with uh, the people, the rest of the people of God, the Israelites, the, the Jewish people, had uh, been exiled to Babylon. And um, there were some instructions we found in the, through the prophet Jeremiah that you're going into exile, you can't fight it, it's going to happen, you need to just go, and you need to go ahead and just put down some roots there. And, uh, and, and there was this, these instructions, and we kind of walked away with this idea that like when, when we are, are exiled, so to speak, and I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment, but at, when they were exiled, it was not go and you know, hide in the corner, it was not rejected altogether, it was make your home but be faithful in the process. And, and we kind of talked a little bit about how ourselves, uh, at some level, we are walking through a place that is home, but it's not really home, that we have another destination, uh, that one day we will all be united with our, fa our Heavenly Father in heaven, and uh, everything, will be, everything will be restored uh, back to new. In fact, in the Revelation, uh, this sort of foretelling of what the future will be, in Revelation chapter 21, we read that, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth, and there there will be no pain, no sorrow, no crying, no shame. All of those things are gone away. Everything is new. And so that is ultimately our home, but we continue to sojourn or to walk through this life um, at home, but not yet. And so uh, we, are t we too are exiles. We are uh, sort of in waiting, if you will, to one day return home. And so Daniel was in Babylonian exile. And so it's this season of life, this time in which he is invited to put down roots and, and to, at some level, assimilate with the culture, but not to give up his values. And so the whole premise of the book of Daniel, I believe, is conviction over compromise. It is to settle in and to become one with your culture, but not to be influenced by it to the point where it changes who you are and your values particularly in the arena of our faith and our allegiance to God who created us and redeemed us through the person and work of Jesus Christ. So that's where we're headed. And so today we're going to just jump right into chapter 1 of Daniel. And so if you've got your Bibles, you can follow along. If not, I'm going to invite you to look at the screen. We'll have the 
the words to the scripture up there. But uh, in verse 1 of chapter 1, we read this. During the third year of King Jehoiakim's reign in Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar, right? King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and besieged it. He took it over, right? He came, conquered the people of God, took them uh, as his property, and the Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure uh, house of his God. So King Nebuchadnezzar comes in, uh, conquers the, 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 pro the property, the place, um, the nation of Israel, and takes them all back to himself. And in the process of conquering the people of God, God allows that to happen. And if you remember back from last week and through the prophet of Jeremiah, they were, they were told this would happen because of their disobedience. And so we want to talk in a moment about obedience, but please understand at the very get-go, what got them in this situation was their lack of obedience. And this is all what God said will happen, and it ultimately did happen. And so in verse 3, the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, so the right-hand man, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and the other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, good-looking men. I'm already out. And he said, make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning and gifted with knowledge and good judgment then they are, and, and are suited well or to, suited to serve in the royal palace. So essentially... The king sent his chief of staff and said, I want you to go out there and look among these folks that we have, we have taken, and I want you to pick the best of the best. I want you to bring to me the youngest and the brightest and the sharpest and bring them here so that they might serve uh, here in the royal palace. He says, train these young men in the language and the literature of Babylon. The king assigned them to a, da a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. So, He's serving them kingly food. They were to, uh, to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. So go out and find the youngest, the best, the brightest. Bring them in here, and um, we're going to train them up. We're going to prepare them, three-year process, and then they can serve. So only the best of the best, and we want to spend three years shaping them and preparing them to essentially assimilate not just to live in our culture but to serve in the palace of the king to serve in the government right to be part of and so um you talk about assimilation like that was the goal and we we mentioned this last week part of the 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 babylonian exile was bring them in help them become like us and then as they become like us as they meld into the culture and adopt our ways then they will no longer be foes but they will be friends and they will be helpful right they will be allies and so daniel hananiah mishael and azariah were four of the young men chosen all from the tribe of judah the chief of staff renamed them with these babylonian names so they bring them in and the first thing they do change their names so daniel they called belt Eshazar, hananiah was called shadrach mishael was called meshach and Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and the wine given to them by the king. Now, Paul's right here. We're going to come back to this. In fact, I'll just go ahead and tell you, we're going to camp out here in a little bit. Uh, Dan they've, they've, they've selected these four men, and they're, they're going to enter into the training process, and they're, they are going to be taught and and shaped and molded and they're going to be fed and fed well they're going to be fed by the king whatever the king eats they're going to eat and so but daniel decides or determined uh, some translations might read resolved not to defile his body by eating the food that the king was eating now as uh, a jewish boy like he had dietary standards that were given by the law and daniel was supposed to live by these and so as he is assimilating into this culture and being trained and prepared within his life there's certain non-negotiables and for Daniel and this is probably a little bit difficult for us to really grab a hold of but for him 
to eat the king's food, to eat things that were outside the realm of the defined Jewish dietary law really was a deal breaker for him. There were, it was a non-negotiable. And, 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 and so it would have been easy and it would have been very enjoyable for him to enjoy what the king was eating and drinking. It, I'm sure it was the choicest of food. It was the fattiest of food. It was the choicest of wine. It was the best that could be had. But Daniel had an allegiance to his God that did not allow for him to take part in that piece of the Babylonian culture. Do you follow me? And so, right here in verse 8, we read, But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food given to them by the king. Now, we're going to come back to that here in a moment. So, he asked the chief of staff. So, he pulls the chief of staff, not the king, but the chief of staff, pulls him aside. He asks for permission not to eat the unacceptable foods. He says, you know, these things I can't have. I would like to avoid eating that. Uh, and, and so, now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel. And I think that is to be noted, right? Anytime that we are living in obedience to what God would have us do, I believe that God works on our behalf to give us, at some level, the favor or the affection or the, 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 the respect of those around us. I believe that's a gift from God, and he's doing that because of Daniel's faithful obedience. And so he asked for the, uh, or he has the respect and affection for Daniel. Verse 10, but he responded, the chief of staff, I'm afraid that, the Lord, that my Lord, the king, who has ordered you, that you eat this food and wine, uh, I'm, I'm worried of the king who has, who's the one who instructed you to eat this food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youths of your age, I'm afraid that the king will behead me, right? So this is serious stuff. Kings, kings got authority. Kings a little bit loose. He's a little bit crazy, right? And, and so the chief of staff says, I hear what you're saying, but I'm concerned because if you don't prosper like the other folks who will be eating the king's share, like, I just, I don't want this to come back to me, right? It really was about him. And he knew how crazy and wild the king was. And so Daniel spoke with the attendant. So uh, the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel. So Daniel went a step below the chief of staff because he realized he probably was getting nowhere with the chief of staff. And he got his, you know, his, the chief of staff's assistant who had been assigned to watch over Daniel. And so Daniel approaches him. Um, and he's been, uh, and so he says, please test us. And, and this guy's watching over all four of them. Uh, he says, please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. Now, don't get too crazy with that, right? This, I think, is hard for us to understand because of the way, uh, in the light of Christ, we understand the law, but obedience still remains the same, Right? And so he says, let us, let us live within our convictions. Let us live on the vegetables and the water. Those are the things uh, that, we, that, we can, that we can participate in without getting outside of our level of obedience that we want to be living in, right? He says, let us do that and just test us. See how it works out. See if we don't come out better on the other side. See how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. Now, I'm assuming at this point that Daniel and his, his, his three buddies knew, they were confident, they had faith that if he would let them live in obedience to God, that the alternative is not even an alternative because he's, they're going to prosper. He believed that because I'm sitting here asking like, what happens if they do dry up and don't really make it, right? You know, he says, you, you test us for 10 days Make your decision. And so the attendant, in verse 14, we read, agreed to Daniel's suggestion, Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. The end of 10 days, guess what? Daniel and his three friends looked healthier, better nourished, and then young men who had been eating uh, the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine that was provided for the others. So 10 days, they passed the test. And so after that, the attendant continued to let them carry on with their vegan diet. And everything, it was all great. And they continued to, to be nourished, and they were incredibly healthy. And so in verse 17, God gave these four young men 
an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings and the visions, and uh, meaning of visions and dreams. And so we see here that not only are, are physically are they growing, you know, living within obedience to God according to the dietary law. They, you know, Daniel says we have to abide by this. We've determined to be obedient to this, and therefore, that's what we're going to do. And if you'll just test us, God's going to work it out. Sure enough, God works it out. And so not only do they remain physically healthy, but we read here that through, and, and, and I'm, I'm reading into this, through their obedience to the law, God gives them special favor, special gifts. He gives them uh, this aptitude, this ability to understand the language. They just are acing everything, right? And, and it's not that they, are, they never were instructed to push back on the king or to say, no, I won't do this. They said, we are going to live, this is, the, this is the boundaries, a predetermined level at which we're willing to participate and they stuck to it and God has blessed them it's it's pretty simple and straightforward and so we read in verse 18 when the training period ordered by the king was completed the chief of staff brought all the young men to the king or to king Nebuchadnezzar and so the king talked with them and no one impressed him as much as guess who the four right Daniel uh, and let me see if I can say their names right I want to say Shadrach Meshach and Abednego, but uh, I didn't, where are we at here? Yeah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the royal service. So they were commissioned, right? Go ye, therefore, you have done well. Whenever the king consulted them about any manner, any manner requiring wisdom uh, and balanced judgment, he found them ten times more capable than any of the magicians and enchanters in his entire kingdom. Daniel remained in the royal service until the first year of the reign of of King Cyrus. And so, what we see here is just a simple, just, just one little blip on the radar of Daniel's life. But, but and, and I think we could walk away from this and say, okay, everybody go home, eat nothing but vegetables and water, and God's going to bless you, and just leave, right? And I know, you know, some of you might be like, that's probably not a terrible idea. We'd be more healthy, we'd be, you know, we would practice some obedience, and, and so I'm not going to say that's a bad idea. But what I do believe, there's more to the story than just simply you should obey the same diet. You know, we should just all have strict dietary laws and therefore everything will be fine, right? What's happening here, and this is what stands out to me, and I think this is so incredibly important when it comes to knowing what it's like to live inside a culture that's not your own, to live inside a culture that might seek to shift or, or move us in a certain direction, how do we remain obedient in a, in a culture that really is, is against kind of who we are as, as followers of Jesus? I think there's something here that's very, very important for us to see. And it's right back there in verse 8 where I first mentioned. But Daniel, this is, this is in, in verse 8, but Daniel was determined to not defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. Long before the option was given to them, Daniel had decided this is a place that I'm not willing to go. This is a level which I'm not, this is a threshold I'm not willing to cross. He determined ahead of time. And so uh, this, this idea of determined obedience can really, I believe, is really a principle of our faith. Um, and, and, and I say that because if, you, if we look back through Scripture, there's tons of evidence where a predetermined obedience to something. Now, let's first start with obedience. Let me, let me say this right off the bat. If you go back from the very beginning of Scripture all the way to the very end, there is an, an invitation, there is a charge, a challenge to obedience. There is a direct correlation to our honor of God, and it, and it is directly correlated to our obedience to God. Our disobedience breeds and produces dishonor. Obedience breeds and produces honor, right? If, if you want, you know, and you can look at it even at a, a much smaller level, like in your relationship with your, with your spouse, okay? And when I say obedience in that, I'm not talking about husbands, you can tell your wife to do this or don't do that, but, but literally like, uh, dis, you know, obedience to the level of this agreed upon covenant relationship 
Obedience is going to increase the intimacy. In, obedience is going to increase the relationship. Disobedience is going to foster uh, dishonor. It's going to foster uh, lack of. Tr- it's going to foster uh, lack of trust. It's going to create problems. Right? We know for a fact that obedience to God leads us to His provision. Right? When we obey God, it leads us to His provision. We know that when we obey God, it leads us and guides us toward His protection. It, it helps, uh, helps us achieve and discover our purpose. It gives us freedom and joy and all of the things you can lay that out. Even back in the, in the Garden of Eden where it all began, God said, you got all of this, right? And I need you to stay away from this right here. It was a call to obedience. And a, and a call to obedience says you can have all of this, stay away from this. And yet it was Adam and Eve who chose the way of sin and said, but we prefer disobedience over obedience, right? And so we're going to go this direction. And so obedience breaks down. I mean, disobedience breaks down. Obedience builds up. So we beat that horse, slap to death. You get it, right? But oftentimes, obedience in the moment, especially when times are difficult, especially when we are being tossed and turned, it's not always easy to be obedient in every situation of life. Can anybody say amen to that? It's not always easy to be obedient at every level. Sometimes it's very tricky, right? And so what we hear here is that there was a determination in Daniel. He decided ahead of time that he was going to be obedient in this situation long before he ever got in the throes of, by the way, here's supper, you need to enjoy it. He had already decided ahead of time what that would look like. Um, One of the things our family... Uh, loves loves to do and I say that because I do and so I just assume they do too but um, I love to go to the beach and I love our beach I love to sit out here and watch the sunset and feel the breeze I'm not super brave enough to jump out into the water um, but I love to go to like Gulf Shores Orange Beach it's a quick drive the water's a little more clear a little more safer uh, there's actually some waves right and our kids love to play in the waves and as they've gotten a little bit older I'm a little more trusting to let them go out and play in the ways and so like for mother's day we went uh, that saturday we drove over to orange beach and we hung out on the beach it was a ton of fun it was relaxing it was awesome the kids carried a couple of boogie boards and they got out there in the waves it was so much fun they had a blast and they didn't fight for like at least 20 minutes it was awesome and so but here's the crazy thing and if you if you spend much time at the beach you know you kind of got like you got sand you got water like you, you got the shore but the way the waves come in, I guess because of the way Alabama Beach is, you know, it's, they're, they're kind of coming in at an angle, right? They're coming in at an angle. And so when the kids go out this direction and they go, I don't know, toward the fourth row there, um, as they continue to play, what happens to them? They start going off in a different direction, right? And, and, and for the love of me, I can't figure out on a day that crowded why somebody was shore fishing, but like they're wade fishing over there. It's like there's lines going out, and I'm like, y'all got to come back over here. And constantly, I, we had to correct them, like, come back. Because out there, they can't really tell how far off they are. But where mom and dad are sitting watching them, they continue to drift away. The current carried them. When I think about the culture that we live in, culture, any culture, culture has a way of moving us in a direction, and we have no idea we're even walking that way until we wake up one day and say, how did we get here from over there, right? Right? And, and this, is, this is so incredibly true, I believe, especially for um, in our younger age. And I won't say young kids because I'm as guilty of this. But, like, we have lots of hopes and dreams when we're younger. And then somehow then we get older and realize, like, how did we even get here? And it was this slow. It wasn't, it wasn't a major shift or a major change or a major course. Uh, change. It, was, it happened slowly and, and just gradually we move over here. Now, the reason I bring this up is I think with, with Daniel, it probably would have been easy just to say, well, if this is the food we've been given, God won't mind if I just do this one time, right? Like this won't, it won't, it's just food, right? It's no big deal. It's no big deal. But then what comes next? And I think what's so incredibly key here is that simple word determined. There was a decision made by Daniel ahead of time that I'm not going to go, I'm not going to go there. And, and, I, and I heard somebody tell me, and I don't know if it was my, my dad or uh, a mentor of mine, 
but it was this idea that, and, and I wish I could quote it, but it's like we determine in the light what we want to accomplish in the dark when the darkness comes. We, d- we determine when we're not under the pressure what we want to do. When, and so y'all know this principle to be true, right? It, in, if you have kids, you know this principle, and I'm about to explain it to you, and you'll fully grab a hold of it, right? So you got to run into Walmart or the grocery store, wherever, right? And you need bananas, milk, and bread, right? I don't know why I picked those three, but I did. You need those three things. What do you tell your kids before you get to that spot, that wretched place between the aisle, the the checkout thing, you know, that has all the candy bars and every pack of gum known to mankind? What do you tell your kids before you ever get out of the car? We are only getting bread, milk, and bananas. We're not buying any junk, right? Maybe that's just us. Does anybody else say that? You've ever said that one time in your life? Or maybe you're leaving some amusement park and you cannot exit without going through the throes of of the gift shop, right? And you say, we are not buying anything. And so you say that ahead of time because how many of you have forgot to say that and you found yourself right there in front of the cashier, uh, you know, some other person behind you who's staring you down and your kid is throwing a fit and they got a candy bar in their hand. What are you going to do, right? You're going to buy that candy bar just to shut them up, and you're going to move on because you didn't determine ahead of time we're not buying the stinking candy bar. I'm sorry. I'm having a moment here. <laughs> just kidding. I, I'm just kidding. Our kids really, really do not do that bad. But here's, here's the reason we, we, we dramatically interpret this. It's true in our spiritual lives. It's true in our moral lives. If we don't decide ahead of time, hey, I'm never crossing that line. When you get in that moment and two drinks turn into 12 or, you know, a a simple text message turns into just a lunch, right? Things can get incredibly dangerous very quickly. And if you don't determine ahead what you're going to do, when you get in the moment, it's going to be very difficult to say, but that's beyond, that's a non-negotiable. Because at some point, when you take just that one first step, it's an incredibly slippery slope. It's a very slippery slope. I'm trying to monitor my time, and I, I, won't, I don't have time to share with you this story, but parents, I'm saying this to parents, I want, this is your homework assignment, right? I want you to go and read Proverbs chapter 7, okay? You know, if you miss everything, go write Proverbs chapter 7. It is, it is a story you didn't even know was in the Bible, I'm betting. But there's a story, and there's a story in Proverbs, actually. And it's a story about a young man who is, um, is walking down the street, and he's met with a woman who is attractive. And the guy who's telling the story, the narrative, is coming from someone looking down on the situation, and he's like, it's a trap. It's a trap. It's totally a trap. Stay Stay away. And it is, it is at the onset of this story that we read this. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. I wasn't going to do it, but I'm going to read it to you. Follow my advice, young man. Follow my advice. And this is not on the screen. Follow my advice. Always treasure my commands. Speaking from the board's perspective here. Obey my commands and live. Which, by the way, if you need another example of the connection, the correlation between obedience and and joy, obedience and freedom, obedience and honor. Obey my commands and live. Guard my instructions as you guard your own eyes. Tie your fingers, tie them on your fingers as a reminder. In other words, do whatever you got to do lest you forget the truth about who God is. You follow me? Do whatever you got to do. If you got to put a a note on there, if you got to invite an accountability partner, whatever it may be, Do whatever you've got to do. Tie a string around your finger as a reminder, lest you forget. Write them deep within your heart. Love wisdom like a sister. Make insight a beloved member of your family. Let them protect you from an affair with an immoral woman. And I'll just stop right there. You can read the rest of it. It gets real good. And then at the end of the story, when things do not go well at all, it's basically a repeat. So listen to me, my sons. And pay attention to my words. Don't let your hearts stray away toward her. Don't wander down her wayward path, for she has been the ruin of many, many men. They have been her victims. 
Stay tuned to my word. Write it on your heart. Put it, put it on your finger. Do whatever you have to do to decide ahead of time not to fall into temptation. If you don't want to get swept up in the current, if you don't want to slide down that slippery slope, the best decision that you and I can make in our lives is to, ter- to determine ahead of time what are the non-negotiables of my faith. What are the non-negotiables of my marriage? What are the non-negotiables of parenting? What are the non-negotiables? Where is the line at that I, can, that I will not cross? And determine now, in conversation with your spouse, in conversation with your kids, in com- conversation with those who are walking this faith journey with you, determine ahead of time what is the threshold, what is the limit, and stick to it. You're far more apt to stick to it when you decide ahead of time do i make myself clear amen all right so one last example which leads us to our next point and um we can probably go ahead and invite the kids to uh head back this direction one last point the greatest example that we have of determined obedience is none other than you guessed it jesus christ who for the joy set before him endured the cross who for the joy set before him endured the pain and the shame of the cross. Jesus determined long before he was ever faced with the pain and humiliation and shame of crucifixion, he determined ahead of time, I'm going to do this. In fact, we hear him talk this out in his conversation with the Father as he has his disciples gathered around the table as, as, they, as they leave the table and he, he's praying and he says to his Father, he says, if there's any way for you to take this cup away from me, if, if there's any alternative plan to this, I'm willing to take that, but not what I want, what you want. We've, we've had this conversation before, Right? It is, it is a determined obedience. God, I would love if you could come up, like, just kind of send something. I don't, Jesus wouldn't have said this, but I'm thinking, like, God, if you got a plan B, if you would come up with some other way to redeem the world that it doesn't have to ride on my shoulders, I'm okay with that. But what I'm not okay with is not doing what you want. And, I'm, and so I'm willing to do whatever you want. A predetermined obedience will keep you and I in a relationship with our Heavenly Father that, 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 will, that will ultimately bring honor to His name, it brings joy to our hearts, and brings purpose to our lives. And so today, we gather around this table, and as we do so, we remember. We remember Jesus' determined obedience all the way to the cross, to determine ahead of time before He was arrested, before they started beating Him, before they raised Him on a tree, He determined ahead of time This is what I'm going to do. I'm going in this direction, and I will not negotiate. I will not compromise, but I'm going with the conviction of my heart. And so that's my challenge for each of you this day. Throughout the whole series is to choose conviction over compromise. Particularly today, I invite you, I beg of you to determine your obedience before you're at a place where it's really difficult to decide. Determine what does it look like to say yes to Jesus and to say no to the ways and the culture of our world. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this meal. We thank you for the bread and the juice. Most of all, most importantly, we thank you for your son Jesus who gave his life, who gave his body and shed his blood so that we might receive forgiveness of sin and new life in this day and age and in the life to come. We ask now, God, that you would send forth your Holy Spirit to be with us in this place, to embody somehow this wafer and this juice to become for us your broken body and your shed blood that we might be redeemed after having shared this together. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. On the night Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread and he took wine And after giving thanks to the Father, he shared it with his disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. He took the cup and he shared it. He said, this is my blood. It's the blood of the new covenant that's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you gather in remembrance of me. And so we gather around this table 
to take bread and juice, wafer and cup. And we do so that we might remember the incredible act of Jesus, his incredible obedience that led to our redemption. And so I'm going to invite our servers and the worship team to come forth and join me up here. Um, we are still doing communion with, uh, with this cup. And so just as a way of instruction, and let me, let me start by saying, this is the table of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is not our table. It's, it's the table of Jesus. And you are invited. So whether you're Methodist or Baptist or whatever you may consider yourself, know that you have an invitation from Jesus to come and to partake of the grace at this table. Um, you will receive a cup, and in the cup is a wafer on top, juice in the middle, and uh, the server will give you one. We'll have a server at each four corners, two in the back, two here up front, and you'll receive that. Uh, they'll remind you that this is the body and the blood of Christ. Uh, you're welcome to open it and take it right there. You're welcome to take it back to your seat and receive it. The band's going to lead us in some music. The first step is going to be to uh, take the cellophane off the top. And I always struggle with this. But you're going to remove a cellophane layer off the top and take the wafer and consume the wafer. And then you're going to peel the foil layer off and you may take the juice. Uh, we will put the servers in place and invite you to join us in just a moment. The table is set, and you may come. Just 
decided that I will follow you. I have decided no turning back. No turning back. No turning. My life for your fame My every move brings Glory to your name This is my anthem My life for your fame My every move brings Glory to your name I will find God, we thank you so much for giving yourself to us in this meal. Um, may it serve as far more than just a reminder, although we are so grateful to be reminded of the goodness and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to himself in radical grace and to radical obedience. Uh, God, we thank you for your son Jesus and for this time that we spent together. Enable our hearts, Lord, to say yes to you no matter where you would go, no matter where you would lead us. May we follow you day by day and never turn back. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Hey, real quick, don't forget to come back next week, but also I failed to mention earlier, we have a very, very special guest with us today. Um, our good friend Stephen Long is in the back, in the way back, in that corner, and his wife Beth and Ele Eleanor Wright is back there. I think I can see, yes, I'm having a hard time. But anyways, Stephen's back in town. As you remember, Stephen used to lead us in worship a few years ago, and uh, he's back in town and visiting with us. And Stephen, we're grateful that you would choose to spend this time with us, and I hope y'all get to say hi to Stephen before you leave. Have a great week. We'll see you.